Found with all those miles to shoot up all those, those, those black folk. Why, why didn't God, God, why didn't God just cause the car to stop? Why didn't he cause him something? Where was God in the midst of that? Where was God in, in Texas when all those children were trying to figure out what they were going to do and playing dead and they got shot and killed anyway? Where was God? You can't tell me there's a perfect God when things happen like that to our children. Why didn't he stop my dad from leaving? Why didn't he stop my mom from showing me some of the things she showed me? Why? Why doesn't he stop the war in Ukraine? Why are all those people have to flee as refugees to nearby countries? Why, 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 why? I hear you telling me he's perfect, but I see a whole lot of imperfect stuff. Are you ready for the word of the Lord this morning? Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. I got to preach after that. I love my job. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you and we honor you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity that we have, Lord, to be engaged, equipped, empowered, and encouraged to do your will on this earth. Help me to preach this word, God. As you have given it to me, may I give it to them, and may it fall upon the fertile ground of their heart. I decrease as you increase, Lord, until there is no me left. Have thine own way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you can remain standing for the reading of the word. And today we are coming out of Psalms chapter 18, verse 30. And it reads, as for God, his way is perfect. You could take that reverb off, please. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. You may be seated in his presence. As for God, somebody say his way is perfect. Amen. I still hear it. Sound booth, please. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. Somebody say he's flawless. Amen. So we're going to get into this word today. If you are taking notes, and I, I pray that you are, the word of the Lord today is simply entitled flawless. Flawless. Um, check this out. As, as human beings um, living in a fallen world, we are all too familiar with imperfections. How many of y'all recognize there's imperfections all over the place, everywhere we look, all, all the time, all around this world? Uh, we are very familiar with imperfections. In fact, you'll be hard pressed to find anything uh, uh, on earth that is perfect. It, 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 it doesn't matter where you look, you're gonna have a hard time finding something that is absolutely, absolutely perfect. Now, even though we all know that, sometimes we get, we get all caught up and, and, and whether it's based off of our actions or based off of the way we think or maybe what we think subconsciously, the reality is sometimes we do, even though we know that nothing is really perfect, we sometimes expect things to be perfect. Even though we know we're hard pressed to find anything that is perfect, we still behave as though there are some things that are. I have news for you in case you haven't yet figured it out that there is no perfect political party. It doesn't matter. Is there, there is no, and I'll go a step further, there is no perfect presidential candidate. It doesn't matter. I know I see people, and you, as you should be, marching your way to the polls, but some of y'all got a little bit more optimism than I think y'all have. Because it doesn't matter. You look through the history of this great nation, one after one, you are never going to find a perfect president. It's just not going to happen. But, but oftentimes we, we deal and we handle ourselves as if we expect them to be just what we know they cannot be, perfect. It doesn't matter all the way down to your, to your local government. There is no perfect party. There is no perfect candidate, which is what drives me nuts about the constant back and forth and fighting and, and this one is right wing, this one is far left, and this one is all going on. Nobody is perfect. On both sides, there's all kind of stuff that's wrong. So stop. Go to Jesus, Lord and Savior. Let him guide you. Praise the Lord. Some of y'all looking at me like you don't believe me. So we're going to keep moving. 
see how that works for you. There is no perfect food. I know you may have your favorite food. You may have, this is, this is my favorite food, and this is perfect. And I know some of y'all looking at me saying, well, it's perfect for me. I hear you. But there is no perfect food. There is no perfect uh, uh, one, one dish that you can eat, and no matter how much you eat it, you, you go to the doctor, and they say you have a perfect bill of health. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how healthy that dish is that you love. It is not perfect. This is why oftentimes you have to supplement your, your, your meals with other things. This is why they say you have to have a balanced diet. If you eat all vegetables, shout out to the vegetarians, the reality is you're eating all vegetables, you must supplement for the things that meat brings. If you eat all meat, I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> but if you eat all meat all the time, guess what? You need vegetables. And it goes on and on and on. Why? Because there is no perfect food. You've got to find yourself a balanced diet diet. Shout out to all the fathers, all the men. Let me help you out this morning. Newsflash, you are an imperfect father. As much as you may try, and I know that you're trying, as much as you do, and I know that you're doing, as much as you reflect, and I know that you're reflecting, as many children as you have raised, as many mentees that you have mentored, and the list goes on and on and on, and all the things you do that nobody ever sees you do, but you do it anyway. I have new, a news flash for you, and I pray that you find comfort in me saying this. You, man of God, are imperfect you're imperfect and so relax and breathe and stop trying to be just that I'm not saying stop trying to move forward and be the best you can be but take the pressure off of yourself of thinking that you have to be perfect it's a fight in futility there's no perfect vacation or getaway the weather is good or but it's expensive it's cheap but the weather stinks so on and so forth there is no perfect vacation. And so here's the reality. We are so familiar with imperfection. Stay with me now. We're so familiar with imperfection that, that, that when we come into a, 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 a realization that there are some things that are perfect, we, we struggle. If we're not careful, we come into a relationship with a perfect God. And because we've gone for so long, knowing in the back of our mind, well, nothing's perfect, we come into a relationship with the perfect God, and we struggle. Even though we act and we treat other things in this world like, like it should be perfect, and really we act as if those things should be perfect because we want it to be perfect, but we know that it's not. And we know that we know in our subconscious and in the front of our mind that nothing is perfect. And then we come into this relationship with a heavenly father who's amazing, who's mighty, who's great, who is, is, is fearless, who is powerful, who is loving, who's God of grace, who's God of mercy, who is all of these different things. He's attentive, he's meticulous, he's provider, he's way maker, he's promise giver, he's tear dryer, he's heart mender. He's all of these different things. But in the midst of all those things that we know that he is, sometimes we struggle because we're living on this side of heaven. We struggle with the concept that our God is flawless. He is without flaw. We think we, 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 we can grasp it. But on this side of heaven, like we just shown, there's nothing perfect. And we hear that growing up all the time, don't we, when we're kids, we try our best at something and they say, it's okay, honey, nobody's perfect. And it's true, it's true, but we go all through life with, with, with this clear understanding that nothing and nobody is perfect. And then we come into a relationship with a father who is flawless. And as a result, if we're not careful, we struggle. We struggle to imagine a God being flawless, without flaw. We struggle to, to imagine how ever since the creation of mankind, since the very beginning, God has never, not once, ever made a single solitary mistake. We struggle to fathom that reality. And this is not something that we walk around talking about. You know, you know, you know, we, you know, hey, how you doing, man? Yeah, listen, just struggling, you know, imagining the perfection of God. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. Even in our times of prayer, Lord, help us to recognize that you're, that you're perfect. 
This, but, but it deep in the back of our minds because, again, we're on this side of heaven. And everything that we see around us, we see it may be great, it might be wonderful, but you can find a flaw in it somewhere. It's hard for us to imagine a God that is flawless. This is, this is the challenge that we sometimes have. Now, here's the wonderful thing, the thing that I love about my God is that my, my God is, 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 is like the bumblebee. Listen, the bumblebee, we have studied in, in, in our, we, like I've done it myself, but in our society, right, we have studied aeronautics. We have studied how things take flight. We have figured it out, and, and now you see everywhere, you can look in the sky at any moment, and you see planes whizzing by going all around the world. And this took intense study of physics and, and science and mathematics and inertia and all of these different things to try to figure out how do you keep something to defy gravity and remain in the air? How do we do this? And so through all of that studying, we found that certain things concerning weight and inertia and gravity and altitude and all these different things, they all have to fall in place in order for something to take flight. And once we figured all of that out, we said, aha, this is how flight takes place. And then after we figured out how flight takes place, somebody looked and was in their garden and they saw a big old fat juicy bumblebee. And the bumblebee is flying from flower to flower to flower. And everything that we learned about how things take flight, complete, the bumblebee completely shatters all of it. It doesn't make sense. Everything we just learned, it makes no sense that this fat bumblebee with those little bitty baby wings can take flight with such ease. Every, it stands in the face of everything we just learned about how things take flight. And while we are scratching our heads, trying to figure that out, trying to figure out, we're doing the mathematics, and we're looking at inertia, and we're looking at physics, and we're looking at the laws of gravity, while we're doing all of that, the bumblebee is going from flower to flower to flower. It flies anyway. What's my point? I am so glad that while we are trying to figure out how God can be perfect, is he perfect? Is it true that he's perfect? If we look back all the way through the history of time, can, can I find a flaw in him? There's no way that something, that someone can be absolutely without flaw ever since the beginning of the creation of time. And while we are scratching our heads trying to figure out how and if God is perfect, guess what he does just like the bumblebee? He is perfect anyway. I am so, oh, that's a good place to praise him. I am so glad. I'm so glad that God does not wait for us to figure it out for him to be perfect. I am so glad that as we are looking at our lives and we're saying, well, what about this? And what about that? Well, I thought about this. Well, maybe, you know, I know he's been perfect for everybody else, but when I look at this, I'm not such, while we are trying to figure out how it can be that God is perfect, he remains perfect perfect anyway. He'll, he's patient with us, and so he'll, he'll give us time to figure it out, but I am so glad God is perfect. Somebody say, he's perfect anyway. I am so glad that my God, he is perfect anyway. We don't have to wait to figure it out. We don't have to do any of those things. My God is perfect. Now, let's go to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4 through 5, and I want to read you some scriptures. It says, in Proverbs uh, 30, it says, who but God goes up to heaven and comes back down? Who holds the wind in his fists? Who wraps up the oceans in his cloak? Who has created the whole wide world? What is his name and his son's name? Tell me if you know. Every word of God proves true. In other words, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to all who come to him for perfection. Let's jump to Psalms 18, verse 30. And it says, it says this. Psalms 18 says, as for God, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word, there it is, is what? It's flawless. And he shields all who take refuge in, in him. He kills those who take refuge in him. Let's go to Psalms chapter 12, verse 6. It goes on, and God, again, we realize that every time God is repeating something, he's not repeating it because he forgot what he said. He's repeating it because he knows that you will. And so he says it over and over and over again. And he says, and the words of the Lord are flawless. 
like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Can I read you just one more scripture? Praise the Lord, because I was going to read it anyway. Job chapter 38, verse 2. And I'm going all the way to verse 30 because I love it. Job is having this moment in scripture where he, you know, all, it seems like all hell has broken loose in his life. It's, you know, he's sick and he's lost all of his, his finances, his livestock, his house, and, and, and everybody around him, is, is many are dead and he's sick and he gets to a low point where he's scratching, he's scratching himself with a broken pot because there's boils all over his skin. And, and then he starts to question God. Just like we do sometimes, like, okay, I know people say you're perfect, but can it, and it just happen that moment, like, can there be perfection? Can God, can you be perfect? Because if I'm quite honest, it don't seem like it right now. And so he comes to this point where he starts to question God, and then God responds. Somebody say God responds. In Job chapter 38, verse 2, somebody say, I've never heard the Lord speak to me. Well, read your scripture. He speaks all the time. Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? with words without knowledge. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand, Joe. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who was that, Job? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning? or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their, their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Or, or have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Tell me, Job, if you know. Have you, have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? I love it. I just want to keep on going. Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Watch this. Surely you know, for you were already born, weren't you? You have lived so many years, got it all figured out, don't you? Or how about this, Joe? Have you ever entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? To water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert. To satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, tell me if you know all of these things. Point them to me if you know who does these things. Show me the man who knows the way which lightning will come, who, who takes the thunders and he makes them roar. Tell me who created the depths and the winds of the sea. Tell me, point them to me. I can guarantee you you can't because it's me. And he's saying to Job, I am perfect in all of my ways. I am mighty. I am strong. I am faithful, I am real, I am true, I am flawless. And he's not just saying this so that he can brag and say, look what I did, Job. He's saying this because Job is in a moment of distress. 
And he knows, you got to understand this, Job is sitting on the ground and he has boils all over his skin that itch and he has nothing, uh, no house, no home, it's been destroyed and he takes a broken piece of a pot and he's scraping this boil and he comes to this moment where he's at the lowest of the lowest moment and God says all of these things to him because at this moment Job is starting to question. Are you really flawless? Because it seems like in this moment, you made a mistake. Either you're asleep, or you forgot about me, or maybe it's like my friend said. Maybe I did something wrong, and I don't know it, and I'm being punished. But this, it just seems like you're, you're messing up on this one. And so all of this was an encouragement to Job as God reminds him just how powerful and flawless he is. Somebody say he's flawless. flawless. Now watch this. The reality is, family, just like Job, life happens. How many of y'all know life is going to happen? It, 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 you can pray from 10 a.m. to 10 a.m. every day. And some things in life are just, it's just life is going to happen. Your car is going to break down. Somebody's going to get sick. You forget to pay a bill. It's going to happen. Life is is going to, going to happen, and, and things get difficult, especially on, on, on this side of heaven. Things seem like they just, like people have lost their minds, and things seem to get harder and harder as we go through the many storms that we'll encounter in our lifetime. We get tempted to think, maybe, just maybe, maybe, just maybe his ways aren't perfect. Maybe, just maybe. We, we, and this is why God makes sure that in the word of God we have an experience like Job. He's not just talking to Job. He's talking to all of us because at one moment or another we found ourselves, maybe not with boils scratching ourselves, but we found ourselves sitting down at our lowest moment saying, what is going on here? And so, and so we have those moments like Job has. And I, and I realize that as, as sometimes we may ponder, God, where are you in this? I feel like maybe, just maybe, maybe you're not perfect. Because everything else that I see around me is not perfect. Maybe you're not either. And these, again, are not things that you ever say out loud, but sometimes we struggle internally. We struggle internally. And, and I realize that I'm going to have to teach this, this concept over and over. When I was putting this word together and the Lord had me, you know, putting these points together, I said, Lord, I already told them that. He said, son, if you don't say it again, you're going to be up there by yourself. you got to say this over and over because some of them still struggle with the same questions. So preach it again. And so I realize, and this is what Paul says, I, I speak this to you with long suffering. In other words, I know I'm going to have to say this over and over and over again. And I will until you get it. But the reality is there are some of you who are still struggling saying things like, if God is so perfect... Why didn't he miraculously stop the bullets from flying in my neighborhood? Maybe that, that took my best friend when we were younger. If God is so, so perfect, what was going on in Buffalo when that man traveled all those miles to shoot up all those, those, those black folk? Why, why, didn't God, God, why didn't God just cause the car to stop? Why didn't he cause him something? Where was God in the midst of that? Where was God in Texas when all those children were trying to figure out what they were going to do and playing dead and they got shot and killed anyway? Where was God? You can't tell me there's a perfect God when things happen like that to our children. Can we be real? This morning is a struggle that so many people have and I understand it. Why didn't God stop my dad from overdosing? Why didn't he stop my dad from leaving? Why didn't he stop my mom from showing me some of the things she showed me? Why? Why doesn't he stop the war in Ukraine? Why are all those people have to flee as refugees to nearby countries? Why? 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 I hear you telling me he's perfect, but I see a whole lot of imperfect stuff going on. And it goes on and on. What is this? It's like us. We're just like Job, scratching our wounds, saying, God, where are you in this? And I want to I wanna let you know this morning that this, the response to this worldwide question, it's twofold. 
I'm going to give you the response, and, and I'm going to help you, because you may have coworkers that are asking the question. You may have family members and friends asking the question. You yourself might be asking the question, why is all this stuff happening if God is so good? I need you to understand, when tragedy strikes at the hand of another, whether it's through war, gun violence, sexual abuse, and on and on, we have to get to a point where we don't blame God. Some of y'all say, well, why not? Why can't I blame God? We must always focus on man's sin and his use of free will. It is mankind's decision to hurt and to kill. And so to answer the question, why can't God just jump inside and stop that man from hurting other people? The same way that he don't wake you up every morning and say, love me. And you do. Without free will, perfect love cannot exist. And so he's never going to take away our free will, our ability to do what we want, when we want, how we want to do it. Because it, it, it makes it so that we have to make a conscious, a conscious choice every day to either choose evil or choose good. I told y'all this before and I'll tell you again until it sticks. I was right here at this very altar on my wedding day. And as gorgeous as Pastor Asia was when she walked down that aisle, the thing that made it the most special to me is to know that she had options. She could have chosen someone else. But in the midst of all the other guys and all the competition that would love to have a Proverbs 31 woman like that, she chose with her own free will. Nobody held a gun to her head. Nobody made her do it. With her own free will, she chose me. And so I got to experience on my wedding day perfect love. And so it is here on this earth. Without it, this is why we have a tree that is in the Garden of Eden. Somebody said, well, why did God put a tree where they can access it? If he didn't want them to eat from it, why didn't he make it so that they couldn't get to it? Well, because everybody needs a choice. Perfect love can't exist without a choice. The problem is, all too often in a sin-sick world, people choose otherwise. And so they choose to get the gun and shoot small children. And so they choose to get the gun and go to Buffalo and shoot up a supermarket. And so they choose to go on Dixwell Avenue or Shelton Avenue or, or wherever and, and, and sell drugs and shoot and kill. It's because they are using their own free will that God won't take away, though he will punish. Because without it, they can't make a choice. And without the choice, perfect love can't exist. Does that make sense to you all this morning? Somebody say, perfect love requires free will. All right, Pastor Jason, I got you, I got you. But what about, what about the kid that, uh, 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 that died and drowned in the pool? Nobody killed him. What about that? What about the cancer that my uncle was never cured from? What about that? That seems real and perfect to me. What about, what about my friend in high school that got, that got killed in a hit and run? What about that? that was, I mean, that person didn't mean to do it. it was, what, where, where, where were you in that? Where's the free will in all of that? I just want to let you know this this morning. You have to understand, and it may be difficult for you to grasp, because we've all, at some point or another, had to deal with the death of a loved one, a friend, or someone along the way, and it hurt, and you may have asked yourself, where were you in that, God? It's difficult to grasp, but we all have a limited time on this earth. As much as you want to be here forever, I got news for you. It ain't gonna happen, Captain. We all have a moment. We all have an expiration date. Doesn't matter how long we want to be here. We all have a date where the sun is going to set on our lives. In fact, nowhere in scripture does God promise us a limitless number of days on this earth. In fact, not only does he not promise us a limitless number of days on this earth, he promises us the opposite. Don't believe me? I'll show you. Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 14. And it reads as thus. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while 
and then it vanishes. In other words, we are but a vapor. In other words, I'm not promising any of you lengthen uh, all these uh, uh, years that you're going to live to be 140. I'm not promising you that. In fact, I'm not even promising you tomorrow. And so as a result, we must seize the moment and live for Christ now. Now, I know this is difficult. Our, our focus tends to be on, on, on this lifetime. That's our challenge. Our focus is always on this lifetime. However, God sees this lifetime as a means to an end. This life that we are living and we're existing in right now, God sees it all as a means to an end. Well, Pastor Jason, what is, what is the means to an end? This is the reality. The means to an end is to give us the opportunity to live, to exist, so that we can experience his existence. To live, to exist, so that we have the opportunity to choose with our own free will whether we're going to choose life or we're going to choose death. Whether we are going to choose God or we're going to choose Satan. Whether we're going to choose righteousness or we're going to choose evil. Without it, perfect love cannot exist. And so God gives us life so that we can experience love, so we can experience worship, so that we can experience his existence, but also so that we can be saved and live with him and there we will be forever. Somebody say, this life is a means to an end. This is why we all must be born again. The minute we have the opportunity and to tell others the good news, it's all a means to an end. I can't explain to you why this one got healed from cancer and this one didn't. I can't explain to you why this one drowned a couple of summers ago and this one almost drowned, but he got sick. I can't explain that to you. But what I can tell you is this is why we all need Jesus so that we can choose him while we exist on this earth. It's all a means to an end. And that end is in his presence forever. You see, family, our time is going to come, whether it be at the hands of another in an accident, natural disaster, old age, God's plan for everyone is that we will be saved from the chasm that sin has caused and spend an eternity with him. This is why in Luke 13, he's explaining that there is no sinner that's greater than, than the other. In other words, be saved, get saved, repent. Otherwise, when your time comes, you're going to perish. How many know that there's a difference between dying and perishing? Because there is. I'm going to die someday. I ain't going to perish. I refuse. Let me explain. Luke chapter 13, and then we're going to roll. Luke chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. Jesus speaking. He says, now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Now watch. They, they have some of the same questions that we have sometimes when we get frustrated. Jesus answered them. Watch this. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or what about those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were, they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. In other words, some people are just going to pass away. It's going to happen. The goal is that when they do, or before they do, they have repented so that they don't perish. The difference between dying and perishing. Dying is when our, uh, where, we, we, where our spirit leaves our body, our soul leaves our body, and we go on to be either in the presence of the Lord or absent from him forever. Or dying is when, when we breathe our last breath. Perishing is when we die and we go to hell. That is what it means to perish. And so Jesus is saying, it don't matter how these folks died. I, you know, I hate that it happened. Stuff is going to happen. But what's most important is that when before they did, they had Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This is what it's about. Now, now watch this. And I know we're dealing with some heavy stuff here, but I want you all to get this. When it comes to God and his sovereignty, or sovereignty, when things happen, and things will happen as we've seen, we have to be careful of not callously saying, well, that's the sovereignty of God. So-and-so, you know, got in an accident. That's the sovereignty of God. You know, this war in Ukraine is really wrapping up. It's kind of crazy. That's the sovereignty of God. 
And we go on and on. Because what we're saying is, is, is in, in a subconscious way or, or what we are, are, are saying to them subconsciously is that, you know, God is going to do what he's going to do, so you better watch out. He does what he wants to do, so you better watch out. And that's what it communicates to people when you just say, well, that's the sovereignty of God. Be careful about callously telling people it's the sovereignty of God because that inadvert inadvertently suggests to people that God callously does what he wants. Now, it's true that God does what he wants. He absolutely does do what he wants. He is sovereign. He's mighty. And his sovereignty describes his rule, sovereign, his reign. And he reigns as God all by himself. It is nothing that happens that he's not aware of. And so sovereignty describes his rule. However, you have to know God in order to truly find comfort in his sovereignty. In order to, 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 to be able to have someone say to you, that's the sovereignty of God. If you don't know God, that'll scare you. Stuff is going to happen. That's the sovereignty of God. If you don't know God, you spend your whole life shaking in your boots because what's he going to do next? What's going to happen next? What's he going to unleash on us next? But when you know God, the sovereignty of God gives you peace. It gives you joy. It helps you to just breathe deep and know that daddy, Abba Father, is on the job come hell or high water. When you know God, you recognize that, yes, he does what he wants. Somebody say he does what he wants. And what he wants for you is to bless you. What he wants is the fruit of the spirit for you. That's what he wants for you. Yeah, he does what he wants, and that's what he wants. He wants justice for you. He wants salvation for you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants heaven for you. He wants to bless your children. He wants to bless your children's children. He wants to watch you grow and see others come to know Jesus. And so when you come to a place where you realize, yeah, God does what he wants, and what he wants is to bless me. You can rest in the peace of knowing I don't have to be in control. And I know that this world can be all chaotic and crazy. But I have peace in knowing that God, yes, he does what he wants. And what he wants is to bless me. That's the sovereignty and his mighty reign and his rule. When you know God, you're not afraid of his rule. Because you know that you know that you know that you know that he's flawless. And some may be here this morning and you turn back the pages of your life and you find yourself just like Job. You say, yeah, I hear Pastor Jason, but when I get to heaven, God got some explaining to do. I know we think it. Don't ever say it. But I know when you turn back the pages of your life, you got questions that are not answered yet. And I pray that today they're being answered. But we all have those Job moments. Let me, I want to introduce you to someone real quick. I want to show you Brother Nick Vujicic. And I want you to see this, this picture of Brother Nick Vujicic, I got the, the sound booth. You can show that picture of the, the skateboard. And when you see this picture, you're going to say, no, God, you're going to have to explain this one to me. This is Nick Vujicic when he was a young boy, and your eyes are not deceiving you. He is without any limbs, no arms, and no legs. No, he wasn't in a bad accident and doctors did what they had to do to save his life. Nope. This is how he came out of the womb. And, and, and you're looking at this picture and you say, this is a, a young boy who it clearly wants to do what any other little boy would want to do to ride a skateboard. But Nick doesn't have that, though he's, he's seizing the opportunity. He can't do it like the rest of the boys in the neighborhood. He's without limbs of no fault of his own. And so when you look at, at Nick, you say, well, God, I, I know you're flawless. But that doesn't look, that doesn't look like flawless to me. It looks hard. It looks difficult. And I'll do you one better. 
Brother Nick grew up, if you read about his life, and he tried to take his own life. It was a regular occurrence for Nick. Because as children do and as we do as flawed people, we make fun of, we tease, we ridicule. And Nick had many moments in his life where he said, God, I know everybody's saying you're flawless, but I can't walk, I can't do things every single, every day, normal things I can't do. They're difficult to me or impossible. Where were you when you knit me together in my mother's womb, God? And so many times, Nick tried to take his own life. God, where were you? If you're so flawless, where were you? in all of this. Well, if you end at this picture, then you'll walk away like Job did before he questioned God and saying, you know, God, you must have made a mistake. I know you're amazing, but you made a mistake on this one. But if you look at this next picture, you'll come to find that Nick persevered and he moved through and he pressed through and over time he ended up going and preaching you can show that next picture to hundreds of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people all over the world about the love of Jesus Christ and his saving grace and his flawlessness. Today, Nick Vujicic has gone on to write many books and is a motivational speaker all over the world. And guess what? He still doesn't have any arms or any legs. He didn't wait to praise God. He praised him in the midst of what he was going through. Now, just think about it for a moment. Who better to show us how to move forward and walk out the difficulties of life than a true Christian without limbs. Who better to show us how to walk in the light of Jesus than one without limbs? Who better to show us how to lift our hands and worship regardless of your situation, than one who does not have any limbs. And so God knew, I know this is going to be difficult for you, my son, Nick. I know it's going to be hard. I know a lot of people are going to be looking at you. They're going to be staring at you. There's going to be some folks that are going to tease you and ridicule you. But if you just hold on to me, if you just trust in me, I'm going to use you and give you a platform to encourage people to accept me as their Lord and Savior. Because if I can do it in you, I can do it in them. If I can show you how to walk, I can show them how to walk in my light. Who better? Who better? And so if you only saw the first picture, you would have said to yourself, God made a mistake until you see God's plan live and in action. Hundreds of thousands of souls have been saved through the ministry that God is doing through Brother Nick Vujicic. You can't tell me that God is not flawless. You see, it's all about perspective. How are you seeing your life? It's an old saying, it's not scripture, but an old saying that says without rain, you can't truly appreciate the sunshine. How are you viewing your life and everything that has happened to you? You know what we say, it didn't happen to you happened for you. It's about perspective. As long as you hold on to the truth and the reality that come hell or high water, whether you recognize it or not, whether you come to terms with it or not, that somehow, some way, though you're going to shed tears, though you're going to cry, though you're going to be frustrated, though you're going to have some long nights, if you just hold on to his unchanging hand, you are going to see his perfect plan come to light in your life and you can rest in the peace of his sovereignty, knowing that he does what he wants and what he wants is to bless you and to keep you. Just hold. Somebody say, just hold on. Just hold on. Just hold on. Hold on. Just hold on. My God. My God. He is flawless. Even when it seems like he has flaws, he shows that he's perfect. It, it may seem like God screwed up by making the tree accessible to Adam in the garden. God, you messed up on that one. You should have left that tree in heaven because you see how that ended up. 
But it was, but it was all a setup for the true and the greater Adam that would that would pass his test in the garden, closing the gap that sin had caused in Jesus Christ. Adam was tested in his garden, but it set up the stage for Jesus, who would be tested in his garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus would win his battle in the garden. It was all a setup. It's all about how you see it. Listen, you can go in, in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, and it may seem like God's true up when Abel's blood was spilled as he was innocently slain by the one he loved, his own brother. He was innocent but was slain by his brother and his blood was spilled. You can say, God, that seems a little imperfect for me until you realize that it sets the stage for our Savior who would later be innocently slain by those he loved. Instead, this time the offering he would bring would be Jesus himself. You've got to realize that he is a flawless God, he was innocently slain just like Abel was innocently slain. It all sets the stage to show just how flawless he is. How about when you go over to Exodus chapter 1 verse 22 and we read about how Moses was a baby in, in danger of being hunted and killed by a king and would later grow up to be the one God would use to free people from bondage. Sounds like somebody I know. It's all meticulously planned to set the stage for the ministry of Jesus, who would also, also be a baby born in danger of being killed by a king who would later grow up to be the one that God would use to free people from bondage. He is a flawless God. See, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 13, God told the children of Israel to smear the lamb's blood upon the doorpost. You remember that? You can take that picture down. I, don't, I, don't want, I want them to focus. And we told them to smear the lamb's blood on the doorpost because the plague of the firstborn is coming. And so in fear and nervous and trembling, they went and they got the lamb's blood and they smeared it on the doorpost. And when the, when the plague of the firstborn came, everyone who had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost the plague just passed right over. And anybody who wasn't under the blood, they suffered the challenges that came with the plague of the firstborn. And it's all a setup. You may say, man, that sounds awful. That sounds scary. But it was all a setup for Jesus who would later come. And he came that his body will be broken and he would be bruised for our iniquities. And his blood would be spilled, his righteous blood. So now forever we have a blood-stained altar that allows us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Not because you're cute, not because you're all that, not because you have money, but by the blood of Jesus. It was all a setup for the true blood that will be spilled for Jesus for our name sake he is he's flawless I can go on and on and on in Exodus chapter 13 verse 21 the children are afraid they're nervous they had just been freed from the captives of, of, of Egypt and now they're in the wilderness but they're afraid and it's dark and so God causes there to be a pillar of fire that provides protection by day and light by night it was all a setup for those of us who would later come and though we be in our wilderness we would also have the light that lights our path in Christ Jesus we have protection by day and light in the midst of a dark and a cold world you may say man that was hard for the children of Israel but it was all a setup to show how flawless our God really is moves heaven and earth for you but sometimes we change the channel before the movie's over before you see how flawless how flawless he is remember when Moses was out in the wilderness and the people and the children of Israel said I'm thirsty I'm thirsty we out here in the middle of nowhere what are we gonna do what are we gonna do Moses what and they're complaining and Moses gets frustrated and he strikes the rock and did anybody know what happened Water gushes out of the rock. Now you got to say to yourself, why in the world is water gushing from a rock? Water does not come from rocks. It was all a setup. 
for people who were thirsty in the wilderness, lost and thirsty in the wilderness, who came upon a solid rock that would provide ever-living, life-giving water in the midst of their confusion in the wilderness. A solid rock would provide living water. It was all a setup for God to show you how flawless he is is i'm trying to tell you this morning you may look at your situation as a, as a something that's terrible and it's a setback but for every setback i'm trying to tell you it's a setup for god to show you just how amazing he is child of god man of god woman of god just hold on maybe you need to look at about five people and tell them hold on he's flawless hold on he's flawless hold on he's flawless hold on he's flawless He's flawless. He's flawless. He's flawless. He's flawless. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. He's flawless. He's without fault. He's without fault. He's without fault. I don't know what you're going through today, man of God. I know what you're going through today, woman of God. I do know if you're like many of the people in this world, regardless of your walk with Christ, you got questions. Life is hard. I see you, bro. I see you, brother. It's hard out there. Ladies, I know you got it all figured out. Y'all bad, I know. I know. And you are. But can I tell you a little secret, ladies? It's hard for men in today's day and age. It's hard. And so, man of God, I know you might not ever say it out loud. And maybe you're here today, you're saying, you know, I'm, a, I'm trying to be the best father I can be because I never had a father growing up. And maybe in the back of your mind, you're saying to yourself, well, that was one of God's flaws. He, 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 you know, he, he didn't give me a father. Wrong. For his word says to me that he is a father to the fatherless. Who better to father you than the father of fathers? It's all about how you see it. He's flawless. He's without fault. Every head bowed and every eye closed. King David enabled the people of God to be victorious in the midst of a, a battle as a giant king came taunting them and taunting the armies of God. And everybody was scared. And they were shaking and they were trembling. And the whole armies of God were afraid until little David came up. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, this one that is not of God or for God, that he can come before the armies of God and taunt them. And with his smooth stone, whipped it and knocked that giant out. And all of Israel and the armies of the Lord rejoiced and seeing David slay the giant. What just happened? What just, when we really look at it, what just happened? Happen. They're all rejoicing in a victory. They didn't have to fight themselves. It's all a foreshadow of Jesus who would come and he would slay the giant known as the chasm that sin had caused. And today we have victory over sin. We have victory over depression. We have victory over all of these things in a battle that we didn't even have to fight ourselves. It's all a foreshadow to show you just how flawless he is. Maybe you're here today and you're walking and you've been walking through life and you feel like God has forgotten you or you're upset with God and you don't want God in your life because of something that has happened in your life or whatever the case. Or maybe you just want to do what you want to do. And maybe deep down the reason is because you feel like God has forgotten you and he just doesn't see you. 
So as a result, you've been all tied up in, in a sinful lifestyle. But today you realize, oh my God, he's flawless. He's flawless. And I changed the channel before the movie was over. God was just getting ready to show off who he was in my life. Well, this is all a part of your story. If you're here this morning and you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to turn from a life of sin and run to his righteous outstretched hand, I just want you to lift your hand today and say, I need Jesus in my life. I thought he had flaws, but today I see differently. He is a flawless God, and he wants the best for me. If that's you, I need you to lift, just, just lift your right hand high in the air so I know it's you. You're saying, yeah, that's me. I just want you to pray for me to receive Christ. Hallelujah. There's one. I see you, brother. There's two. I see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like to believe heaven is a little louder than that. Just a little. Here's, here's what I want you to do. I'm tired of being up here by myself. And I want you to come over here. I'm not going to put the mic in your hand. But I want you to just put one foot in front of the other and walk and come to this altar so we can pray for you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can you come and join me, brothers? Can you come? I see you. Come on, come on. Y'all need to clap a little loud. They need some encouragement. Hallelujah. I see you. Come on. Come on. I see you. I see you. Come on. You're not by yourself. You're not by yourself. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's join heaven in rejoicing. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Come on, every head bowed, every eye closed. Was it you? Was it you? Come on and join me. I saw that hand go up. I don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to hurt you. But today, sin is going to lose its grip on your life. If you just take those steps, he might need a brother to walk with him, y'all. He might need a brother to walk with him. He might need a brother to walk with him. I'll say it again. He might need a brother to walk with him. I'll say it again. I'll say it again. He might need a brother to walk with him. I don't want this moment to pass. Sometimes that's all we need. Sometimes that's all we need. You're not by yourself. Come on, come on, come on. One foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. It's not easy. Let me go there in front of all them people. I thought you were just going to do it for my seat. He said, if you accept me before man, so will I accept you before my Father in heaven. However, if you try to act like you don't know me in front of everybody, so will I deny you before my Father in heaven. He loved us publicly. He wants us to love him publicly. I'm proud of you, young man. Proud of you. Proud of you. If we can, those of you here at this altar, can you just lift your hands like this? Yeah, you got it. Perfect posture. This just means I surrender. It means I'm tired of trying to figure things out, have my hands all over everything, trying to work it out for my own favor. Lord, I'm going to let you do it for me because that's the kind of father you are. And all of us who are here, if we could press our hands toward these who are coming. We all going to pray this prayer together because we are all in need of an all-sufficient Savior. And if you're there online and you want to pray with us, please feel free to join us. You're included. Say, Father, here I am. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that I have to receive you publicly as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I turn away from a life of sin, and I recognize that you are flawless, that you make no mistakes. And so I run to your righteous and your perfect outstretched hand. Wash me clean as freshly fallen snow. Lord, I believe that you suffered, that you died and were buried. And on the third day, you rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. And you ascended into heaven. And you're praying for me. And you've given me the gift of your Holy Spirit. I receive that gift. Fill me now, oh God, from the top of my head 
to the very soles of my feet. Lord, in this moment, you are mine. And finally, I am yours. Come on, somebody this morning, give the Lord a shout of praise. If you just prayed that prayer, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Welcome to the kingdom. You have just been born again. Hey, we want to help you further your relationship with Christ. We want to send you a booklet. Please click the link in the description so we can get that information to you. Welcome to the kingdom. We will see you soon.